Hi, my name is Jane Grossman and I'm the chair of Northern Nevada Marches Forward. We've got a very timely and important topic for, uh, for this evening. It's making your voice heard. Nevada's every other year legislature starts uh, in just a couple of weeks on February 6th. And tonight you will learn, or for many of you who are pros at this, will be reminded about the best ways to engage with our legislature. We're gonna have a lot of important bills coming up and uh, hopefully we can make some progress. Our organization, Northern Nevada Marches Forward, is an inclusive, volunteer-led organization with a mission to support, spotlight, and uplift the voices, power of diverse people and communities to create transformative social change. Our organization is best known for sponsoring the Reno's Women March, which we've been doing since 2017. I think we're one of the few groups in the country who is still hosting an annual march. Our march this year for 2023 will take place on either March 25th or April 1st. We're still figuring that out. Um, if you'd like to join in our planning, you can um, message me and we'll get make sure you've got an invite to our first planning meetings, which will be next week. Our group also sponsors speed networking events to get to know some of our amazing nonprofits in the area. Last winter, we started this education and action forum um, with local leaders discussing critical topics facing our community. We've discussed many different topics, including anti-Semitism, climate change, LGBTQI, ally training, and many others. Those are all on our website in case you missed any of those and you'd like to watch those again. Um, tonight, again, we're talking about ensuring your voice is heard. We've got Three great speakers, Northern Nevada Marches Forward member, Tina Davis, Christine saunders Land, and John Hatter of the Great Basin Network. So some logistics at this point, please put yourself on mute, especially if you've got any babies or dogs. You get your questions in the chat. Um, our speakers will probably go for about 45 minutes and we'll have time for Q&A. We might go as late as 7.30, but my guess is we'll end early. And uh, uh, Tina, I'd like to turn it over to you um, to introduce yourself a little more thoroughly and to introduce our speakers. Hi everyone, thanks for being on board tonight. We're gonna have a great presentation. I'm really happy to have Christine and John with us. Um, thank you, Jane, for the great introduction. Um, so our legislature is one of the most accessible legislatures in the nation. You can go down to Carson City, you can walk into the legislative building and you can sit in on committees, you can find your legislators walking down the hall or across the street at lunch, you can talk to them, um, you can call them. Um, and it's really great because it gives us an opportunity to participate in uh, the things that they're doing and really let them know what we want to see happen and make our voices heard. Um, I've just popped a link in the in the chat real quick. It's a story that was in the Nevada Independent um, regarding contacting your elected officials. That kind of goes along with what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, that's another way that you can uh, make your voice heard. And um, so one of the uh, the first thing I'm going to do is um, talk about Nellis. It's the Nevada Electronic um, Legislative uh, Information System. And one second here, let me get this bigger. So if you're not familiar with this, this is where all of the bills, um, legislators, uh, legislation that happens during each session is managed from. And up here, you can see where it says welcome. This is where you can, you can um, create your own sign-in and uh, your own legislative password. And then you can track, you can sign up for tracking. Um, this will tell you how to do, how to how to track bills, how to track your legislators. What we're going to do first of all is go over here to the 82nd session, and this is where you can find any bill that you're looking for. If you're looking for an assembly bill, if you're looking for a senate bill, you can. I'm just going to pull this one up um, just as an example. When it pulls, when it comes up, it gives you an overview. You can pull up the bill text, and you can see exactly what it's all about, who wrote it, that there's, you know, fiscal notes, it'll give you all the information about it um, as the session goes through and it goes through committees and votes and etc. Uh, you can look at amendments, you can see who's voting for it, you can see what kind of fiscal impact it's going to have, 
um, what meetings there were, and if there are any exhibits attached. And eventually on the site, there will be a place where you can also provide public comment on bills. If you can't make it down to the session or down to the committee, um, you know, down to the legislature in person, or if you don't have time to make phone calls, it's a really great way to provide comment and again, make your voice heard. Um, this is another place where you can find committees, find all standing committees. Let's say we wanna look at commerce and labor. This will tell you who is on each committee. Um, I'm gonna pull up Sarah Peters here. She's one of our environmental champions up here in our um, District 24. And this will tell you everything you need to know about Sarah Peters. And um, you can find all the other committees that she's on, uh, what you know, kind of work she's done, all kinds of things like that. So, um, so again, I just wanted to give a brief overview of Nellis. I invite you to create your own account and do a walkthrough of it, dig in there, play around with it, see what you can find out. And, and this is another great way for you to really get involved with um, the legislative session really learn about it and find out that your voice really does matter when it comes to the Nevada legislature. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, before we had, before we um, move forward with our presentation, does anybody have any questions? Um, and as we move through the presentations, if you pop your questions in the chat, um, uh, Jackie is gonna be monitoring that and then she will uh, let me know if there are questions and I'll, I'll moderate the questions. Um, First up tonight, we've got Christine Saunders. Christine is the executive director of PLAN, which is the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. Uh, they do fabulous work in Nevada for environmental conservation, for social justice, environmental justice. I'm really happy that Christine is here because she's very knowledgeable and uh, she will she'll give a great presentation. So welcome, Christine. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, like I said, Christine Saunders, um, she, her pronouns. I'm going to share my screen here. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yes. Um, I cannot see the chat. Uh, while I'm here, but I'd be happy to answer any questions um, once I get through kind of the presentation. Um, but like folks said again, I'm Christine Saunders. I'm the policy director with PLAN. Um, I have been here about five years now. Um, prior to working in Nevada, I also worked on legislative um, policies in Oregon and in Colorado with organizations like the Fair Shot for All Coalition and 9 to 5, um, the National Association for Working Women. Um, I really wanted to kind of give a, a very basic concept of lobbying and talking about why are we lobbying. And I know folks are here because uh, you care about doing this and are interested in doing this, but I think it's important to remember that legislators work for us. Um, and being able to lobby is a part of the democratic process. And like Tina said, Nevada has one of the most accessible legislatures that I have ever participated in. But a lot of it is about providing education to decision makers, um, as well as sharing personal stories on why folks should take um, specific actions. Um, and when we lobby, you know, we think about lobbying legislative leadership or committee chairs, um, but sometimes it also involves lobbying local elected officials on state policy, um, whether that be like Reno City Council, um, we also lobby the governor's office or other state agencies, um, but we also lobby other relevant organizations to try to build our coalitions and get other organizations to be in support of the policies we work on. Um, and we can lobby in a lot of different places. You know, everyone thinks of the legislative building in Carson City as the main hub. Um, but last session, because of COVID, we learned that there's a lot of ways that you can participate virtually and those will continue to exist um, in 2023. Um, you can also participate when legislators come home on the weekend in district. There are often different events um, like legislative coffees or town halls that legislators will have um, closer to home to reach their constituents. And then if anyone on the call does live in Southern Nevada, the Grant Sawyer um, state building uh, does live stream all of the committee hearings from the um, legislative building in Carson City to Grant Sawyer so people can participate in person there as well. 
Um, but I think one of the most important things to think about is when do we lobby? So we have 120 days every other year in Nevada, and that includes weekends. So we will have from February 6th to June 5th um, to move through all of the different legislative priorities through the session. And we've already started that process. Um, so you often hear the phrase BDR, and that stands for Bill Draft Request. Um, so on Nellis that Tina was showing, you can see the bills, but you can also click um, to see bill draft requests. And each legislator is given a certain amount, depending on whether they're in the Senate or the Assembly, and if they are newly elected or a returning elected official. Uh, what is frustrating about bill draft requests is that you get one sentence about the topic. So it might just say relating to health care. Um, so you have to wait until the bill text comes out to really get the specifics, but it does give you a sense of the different topics that are going to be um, coming up during the session. We'll say um, there are a number on water, on health care, on education, and on housing in particular for next session that we're seeing so far. Um, but one option, if you're really intrigued by something, you could reach out to that legislator individually and ask for more details on their bill draft request. Once session starts, those will be introduced and they'll also all be listed up on Nellis, so you'll see the full bill text. And they have what they call a first reading, and that's where they would then send that bill to a different committee. So we have um, committees on commerce and labor, natural resources, legislative operations and election, government affairs, um, and more. Bills will go to that committee and that's where we'll have uh, a committee hearing where folks can come in person um, or call in on the phone to testify. Um, they'll take testimony and support opposition and neutral of any of those bills. Uh, and then that bill will have to be scheduled in that committee for what they call a work session. And a work session is when they make any amendments to the bill. Um, and then choose to move it to the full um, assembly or Senate for a full vote, where they will then do the second reading, have a debate on the floor, and vote in the chamber to pass it. And then we have to do the whole process all over again when it's sent to the other house. One thing that's really important to note, though, when thinking about lobbying is that there are deadlines during the legislative session. And if bills don't make it past a specific deadline, um, then they can no longer have any action move forward. So on Nellis, you can click to see a 120-day calendar that'll show you the specific deadlines. Um, but the first deadline is April 14th, and that is the first committee passage deadline. So all of the bills that are out there, unless they're given an exemption, needs to have a hearing in a committee and a vote in that committee by April 14th. Then there's a really quick turnaround and it needs to have a full vote on the floor um, by April 25th to move over to the other chamber. Um, and like I said, everything then will then move forward, start over again and go through June 5th. Um, there are bills where things can um, be exempt from this timeline, um, but that week of the 14th tends to be very, very busy and actually quite hard to get a hold of a legislator. Um, so wanting to make sure that you are making or having conversations to move things forward prior to that to ensure that your bills can make it through a specific deadline if you're following something. Um, and what does lobbying look like? Uh, lobbying is more than just having a sit down meeting with a legislator, although I will say that is a very effective way to be doing things. Um, you can send a letter or an email. Uh, you can do things like publish op-eds or letters to the editor and the media. We know that legislators um, I'll read copies of the Nevada Appeal, the Nevada Independent. Those reporters are also very frequent in the building. Um, groups like Plan and Great Basin will talk after me. We do petitions, so we can then bring like a list of names to the legislature of the, um, all of these folks say that they're in support or in opposition to a specific measure. Uh, you can call into their office phone lines. Uh, you can attend an event um, in um, a local event. So, you know, most of the Las Vegas legislators actually fly home every single weekend um, and will host events there. So I, a number of my colleagues will go to those events to be able to have in-person meetings. Um, people can come in person at Carson City and set up legislative meetings. And again, those are only about 15 minutes long. Um, and then you can testify during a bill hearing. 
Um, but when you're having like conversations and lobbying, I think it's really important to know um, your messaging on your issues and also who is that person that you're lobbying and what might influence them. Is there something that you have in common that maybe um, is a good starting point? Um, some examples that we can use, I recently learned um, that one of the legislators has a women's studies degree, which is the same major that I have from undergrad. So that's something that we were able to talk about and kind of build a rapport before building, going into further conversations. Um, sometimes it will be in silly things like there's a legislator who is a childhood soccer coach of one of our coalition partners. Um, and she's able to get a meet, eating, meeting with that legislator fairly quickly because um, of those other relationships. Sometimes we know that you know legislators care a lot about environmental issues, or maybe they care a lot about children, and you can connect your policy issue, even if it isn't specific to children, um, to say why that um, constituency um, is impacted by the policy you're working on. So doing some, some background information and figuring out what message might be most useful when you're having that conversation or reaching out to elect an official. Um, and then when you do are able to have meetings with elected officials, you know, again, those meetings are only about 15 minutes. Um, so we really want to make sure that people are able to be concise, um, but also get across the clear points and personal stories. Legislators love to hear from their constituents in particular. So if you don't know who your legislators are, I encourage you to look that up right now on Nellis. You can even drop in the chat. I'd love to see if folks, I think we probably have a lot of people who live in assembly districts 25, 27, and 24 on the call. Um, because those people really wanna hear from you. You're the people who they are accountable to. Um, and you know, follow-up is really important when you're talking to legislators. And it's also totally fine to say that you don't have the answer to something um, in that comes up in a conversation. Um, as long as you're able to follow up on those issues. Uh, so that's just like a very brief overview on like the different ways you can participate in the legislative session. Um, but I would be happy to take any questions about like, the legislative process, other ways to participate, or if folks are really interested in knowing about specific legislators um, or committees that we know are out there. Because I know that the legislature looks a little different this time around than we've seen in previous sessions. But I will stop sharing my screen here. Thank you, Christine. That was great. Um, you brought up some points that I had, I had forgotten about. It's been a while since I've participated in the legislative process. Um, but, you know, as both Christine and I said, it's very accessible. And I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you are involved in uh, you know, nonprofits or other organizations, other community activism, um, or this will be helpful for you if you haven't already lobbied your legislators or been down to Carson City or participated. It's a great opportunity for you to get in on this session and, and make your voice heard, uh, get your issues paid attention to. Um, does anyone have any questions? If you do, go ahead and... Um, uh, Jackie says, as she asked, does it need to be your own personal story that you share? Um, I don't think it needs to be your own. Um, it certainly means a lot to have an individual come share their own personal story. Um, I will say I'm there a lot. I actually will be there every day. So if any of you do come down to Carson City, come say hi. Um, but I do bring stories from folks who can't necessarily make it there every day because the legislative building, you know, they're there during the workday. We have folks who can't travel to Carson City for that. Um, so I think it is okay to bring stories of other folks. Um, but having those people be able to reach out themselves is great too. Thanks, Christine. Um, Andrea asks, uh, she says, I'm a senior advocate. Is there anyone in particular you think I should lobby? Um, I haven't had a chance to look at the bill drafts requests so far um, I, on that issue, especially because when it comes to like the healthcare ones, they're not very specific at the moment. Um, I know I can think of some legislators who would already be supportive of issues. Um, I know Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong has some bills about um, healthcare facilities because she has a number in her district. Um, and that there are a number of senior advocates who are really interested in um, housing issues at the moment. Um, and I think on housing issues, talking to anyone um, right now is important. Thanks, Andrea. 
Right, right. I would also say that I think um, just contacting your own legislator, whether it's your assembly person or your or your your senator, um, and bringing the issue to their attention, they may not be aware of it, or it might not be something that they really um, thought about, but bring it to their attention, and they can either help you figure out a way to have it addressed, or they can direct you to somebody who's already involved in that in that same issue. Uh, Jane asks, is it worth worth it to contact legislators who are not your official representative? I've heard some legislators will meet with you if you are not in their district. What do you know about that, Christine? Uh, so legislators will certainly prioritize people who live in their districts. Um, if you are reaching out to people who are not your elected official, um, that does start to fall in line with the state's um, registered lobbyist requirements. Um, I do think there is an unpaid lobbyist registration um, for not that much money. Um, but when you're meeting with people who are not your own elected official, um, then you need to start reporting um, that some of that information to the state. Right. Okay, it looks like that's all the questions we've got for um, Christine. Thank you again, Christine. That was a great presentation. Uh, next up, we have John Hatter. John is the director of Great Basin Resource Watch, and uh, their group uh, monitors mining activity and water issues in our state, and tries to keep the you know mining entities um, in line with our environmental concerns. Sometimes not always successful, but but always working hard at it. Um, uh, John, go ahead and take yourself off mute and say hello. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, and um, I think um, we'll, uh, Tina, you have the presentation. We don't have to start it just yet, but I'll say a little bit uh, first uh, about my organization and myself. Um, um, our organization is Great Basin Resource Watch, as Tina mentioned. We are, I call our, I call our work environmental, environmental justice, because our mission is we work with communities uh directly affect their um land air and water by mining that's the i guess we can kind of start the i've got a few slides not very many so we can start the first one i okay. can want to do that um gives our gives our shows our, our mission there people can see it okay yeah that's our little our logo there is the bristle cone um and uh, by the way, that's a that bristle cone was created by a local artist here in Reno. Um, I saw this uh, drawing that she made number uh, a number of years ago, and I said, "Wow, that is what we do," <laughs> because the mining industry is a is a pretty formidable force in in Nevada, and so we have to stand strong. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about how I got into this work. Uh, I mean, I do. Um, my background is is largely technical. I teach chemistry and math as well at the community college occasionally. Um, sometimes environmental science when they need somebody for that. That's um, and I I got involved in um, community work. Uh, was large, my trigger the trigger for me was going down to the Nevada test site and um, being there and the place that was directly affected. So I think that's. A key to any issue that we work on is to try to connect people to where what's being affected directly. I mean, going to going to where um, uh, you know the impact is occurring effect is the best, but we can't do that in lobbying. So we have to somehow try to bring um, the people that we're talking to, the legislators, into that space uh, as best as best as we can. But that's what really kind of got me. And it moved me in the direction of science and the public interest. And, um, and that was kind of a turning point. And I think that that's something to reflect on in your own um, in your own self. What 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 were turning points for you? And uh, these may also be uh, turning these and all and these may also connect to uh, uh, where legislators what because what we're trying to do in some cases is we're trying to get a legislator to see a point of view or maybe even you know change their point of view so um, that background research on the legislators and what's important to them uh, to help um, to help them to guide them through this process so reflecting on um, what things have changed you to this to the issue that you're working on what got your attention is an important part of it as well um, because you are part of the the you know the, the vehicle 
um, in, in the process. Um, and in our in our work, um, it became very clear, become very clear how important it is that we do connect with the people who are directly affected um, by whatever it is we're lobbying on. And sometimes it's uh, it's very localized, and especially in mining, uh, mining mineral deposits occur in certain places. So there are certain communities who are very much directly affected, and um, and, and it's and that's why uh, that's why it's very important to connect with those communities and those people because they're the ones that are going to be actually a lot of times the strongest voice for whatever trying to whatever try to uh, reform that you're working on. So uh, Tina asked me to talk a little bit about, we do have a bill um, uh, that we're going to work on this this session it has to do with mining pit lakes. I'm not going to get into the details of it, but I just wanted to uh, trace back how difficult it is to get reform on mining in Nevada. Um, and so uh, many of you are, may also be facing a, a daunting task as well. Persistence is obviously an important part of it. Um, the the lobby the mining industry has an enormous budget. They can they have people they can lobby on a, on a, uh, uh, directly at many levels, um, and so uh, we don't have as many people. So and we don't have as many financial resources. So we have to rely on making sure we bring the community that's affected, and and provide them with um, uh, a visual tools uh, to the legislators in a way for them to understand. Um, the issue. So uh, this slide that Tina just put up, um, one of the, like I said, the, the the issue that we're trying to address this session is mining pit lakes. And you can see here, so here's a couple, if you look at this, this particular view graph, because there's a number of different ways to communicate here. Uh, one is, of course, uh, in the upper upper right, that's a pit lake. That's what they look like. Um, most, they don't always look that color. This one not pretty looking, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, visuals visuals are really important, obviously, especially since most people have not, at least in our work, have not been anywhere near a mine site. They may have seen a picture here and there. And the Nevada mining industry is certainly going to give them all kinds of uh, pictures and visuals that look really good. We have to make sure we try to present what we feel um, is important and to present um, what is the what is, how is the mine, how is this aspect of the mine affecting the environment and the community? So the picture there. Um, and then we've got some statistics too, some numbers we present that how many, how much water will eventually is expected to end up in these mining pit lakes and that that water is no longer going to be available to, to be used. Um, so you can see in the blue circle is, is, one, is one communication, numbers. Um, on the lower right, we're comparing uh, the amount of water in the pit lake to some common reservoir, so some reference points. Uh, and then another one, and then also we actually we compare the amount of water in a graphical way, where we compare to the reservoirs and um, uh, the annual use in Las Vegas. So one thing I wanted to point out with this is it's important I th it's certainly important to our work that we have some data, we have some numbers or some, some, this is the scale of the problem. This needs to be addressed, but how you present it might make a difference. For example, think about this when you see it, what really got your attention? Um, a couple of times that we've done presentations on mining pit lakes recently, this graph down in the lower uh, uh, left-hand corner usually gets the most amount of attention because it compares how much water would be in these pit lakes to say the annual use of Las Vegas, especially uh, since there's a lot of voters in Las Vegas, a lot of legislators in Las Vegas. How do we relate this issue to them? Uh, puts that in perspective a little bit. So um, we may not, it may be more useful just to present the visual, uh, the visual representation, not throughout the numbers. It depends on who you're meeting with a little bit, but do some, do your research, get some data. Make sure your data is credible. Make sure your it can't be refuted. Um, we're actually updating these numbers right now because uh, some of our citations were on the old side. So make sure you have that. And then how do we want to present it? What's visually gets people's attention? So I just wanted to give you a sense of 
you know, what, what is the thing that look like that we're, that we're trying to address this mining pit lakes? What are some of the numbers associated with it and how do we want to represent it? Um, so that's an important thing is to have like a kind of a short pager uh, page presentation that gives him some good visuals. Here's another example of a visual. Most people uh, don't understand, don't understand this with mining again, we have to try to bring it to them uh, as well, because most people aren't out in the rural areas. They don't know what the scale is. And even if you do see a mine site, it's often not entirely clear uh, how much it will affect people. So this 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 graph here, uh, we'll probably, I don't know if we'll use this in this legislative session, but you can see what, what the idea here, if you look at this graph, the areas, the shaded boxes kind of in the center are the actual where the mine sites really are. And the outline area shows how much they influence the water in the region. So again, to try to explain, um, sometimes the uh, map like this, uh, maps can be very useful. Mapping tools show, wow, uh, that water is affected way far away from the mine site. And the Humboldt River is along the bottom there too. Let's back up again. Is it going automatically or, <laughs> okay. So this is, so this again is another visual mapping tools can be very useful, especially on a lot of environmental issues uh, to give people a sense of the scale. So that's one of the things that we're, we want to communicate is what's the scale of the problem. Um, and then, then of course, as, as, as Christine mentioned, the personal stories who's affected and how are uh, really a, cr a critical part of it. So if you go on to the next slide, I've got a few pictures here. So here's an example, um, uh, quote coming directly from who's affected from Joseph Kennedy. He explains his religious beliefs and the water that's affected at Mount Denebo. This is not specifically on mining pit lakes, but this is we're trying to communicate how water is affected the importance of water and how the mining uh, a mining project will affect springs and seeps in the area, and then there's a picture showing uh, people at one of these springs that might be affected. Uh, ideally, if some if people can come and testify, that's great. But at least having putting making that connection to the place and uh, how they're affected and the uh, visual, and then the next slide I think I've got another one here. This is also another person. Who who's affected? You can see this, show, this shows people's houses near where the mine site is, and this woman is pointing towards where her house is near the Anaconda mine site. So again, it's people living near, uh, creating that sense of place. And I think I've got another picture here, another one. Here's another another community. Uh, this is a quote from a rancher uh, who's talking about. Uh, how the mine project could affect her personally. This here she is posing with her children, and I think she has a grandchild. And this is a very classic Nevada a kind of rural setting. You've got a, a old time rancher. They've got their <laughs> they're at their ranch with their horse. So this this is, brings people into the issue and it makes it makes it more personal. Very very important um, to have these. And then I think I have another one. And then also sometimes there's images like this that give people a sense of what has happened, the effect, the effect. Again, here we're showing up before and after. It, it's, this is all part of bringing, bringing people to the place uh, that's affected. And we have a couple, we have a quote here from uh, Carrie Dan that puts it in perspective. So I just wanted to show you a couple, you know, visually bringing people into the place. Again, with our work, it's really important that people understand that because so many people live in the urban environment, don't live near a mine, don't really understand um, how it can affect and, and get and, and visually and how it affects them personally. And so it's very important to, to personalize it because that's the one thing that the, um, that's the one thing that we have at our advantage in our work always make sure, we always try to make sure that those voices are what people hear. The, what's gonna convince the legislator more than me talking to him is hearing uh, Carrie Dan, is hearing Joseph Kennedy, is hearing Carolyn Bailey, is hearing the people that are affected. And if they can't be at the legislature, then the next best thing is uh, good quotes and images. 
Uh, we, you can even do possibly one thing that's a, a good process also is to go out and do some video footage, grab, you know, have, have interview people talking about how they're affected. That's, that's, <clears throat> they have time to do that. Um, so those are all um, uh, critical aspects and things that we're going to be working on in the legislature is, again, take home message here is bring it home, make it personal, bring, bring the legislator to the issue, into the issue, take them there. Uh, tell tell your stories, uh, and that stories are best told by the people who are are directly affected, and that's kind of um, that's kind of how we're going to that's how that's how we're going to approach uh, approach this work, make it a personal connection, and um, that's all pretty much ahead uh, uh, for tonight. But that's kind of how we try to take on the mining industry is to is to make that personal connection, bring it into people. Um, some data is important, uh, but uh, you can overwhelm people with data. So connect them, connect the, have the data, make sure it's well um, represented so it's visually makes sense. People get a sense of scale, and then um, you know bring in the directly affected community people. How are the how are they affected, and um, how is that how does that translate to what the legislators' own personal maybe their own personal experience is. So doing some research on legislators, what what's what what's what what uh, what's of their interest, what things might turn their attention, um, is all part of it. Strategize um, on an individual basis. So I'll stop there. All right, thank you, John. That was a great presentation and really um, kind of drives home how you know how how to get the attention of your legislator and how to show them what you're what. You know, show them what you're really talking about and what you want them to see. Uh, does anybody have any questions for John pertaining to either Great Basin Resource Watch or their lobbying efforts or lobbying in general, legislative participation? Um, you know, while we're waiting for any questions, one thing I want to say is, you know, a lot of times we might think that um, legislators are, you know, a different level of person <laughs> and, um, Really, they're they're people like like you and me. They have regular jobs in the off session. They, you know, Sarah Peters is an environmental engineer. Um, uh, Teresa Benitez Thompson, she's um, no longer with the assembly, but she was a social worker. The regular people who live in our community, who are our neighbors and our friends, and as I said before, they're very accessible. They want to know what issues matter to their constituents and everybody in Nevada. So that they can legislate, so that they can do the job that they were hired to do, that they were elected to do. Um, so you know, it's really important for us to 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 tell them what we want them to do, to tell them what's important to us, what we want to see, the changes that we want to see in our state um, and our state laws. Um, uh, John, what is the bill number? Uh, Lois was Lois is asking about that. Oh yes, the uh, the bill number, uh, the BDR BDR. Mm -hmm number yeah. i'm trying to remember it off the i don't remember it off the top of my head i was just looking for that let me see if i can find it uh i thought we had it in our notes but i know we had it somewhere but well john is looking for that uh veronica asked a great question um and uh, Christine, you may know some of this that, uh, you know, John and both of your presentations were outstanding. So thank you so much, so much great information. And I love the specificity, John, of um, the graphs and different ways to present critical data. And Veronica is also very impressed with that and is wondering where can we get those kind of numbers and facts for other issues like women's issues, healthcare, and, um, Christine, do you have some ideas of where people might go to as they're putting together their information to go lobby? Yeah, I think um, one of the things I didn't mention about PLAN as much earlier is that um, PLAN is a coalition of over 30 member groups as well. So we have partner organizations and all of them are listed on our website um, that include um, groups within the reproductive justice field, groups within um, labor, environmental organizing, and so there's information on who all of those other organizations are too on there. 
Um, one of the things we always talk about um, when it comes to engaging in the legislative session and as an activist, it's always really great to find your organizing home. Um, because we know that plan will continue to do outreach on all of the issues we're working on, invite folks to lobby days, um, but all of the partner organizations we work with as well do the same and we support them in doing that. Um, so if there's a specific issue area you really want to learn more about, um, I'd be happy to help connect you um, to that organization. Um, I'll, I'll say a little I'll say a little bit about that also. I mean, from from our perspective, a lot of uh, since we work on um, projects which involve public lands, um, there's often environmental impact statements. Um, and those kinds of that, that are part of the process of permitting. And a lot of times information, uh, we get a lot of information from those kinds of uh, analyses. And the permitting process, uh, the state level permitting process also. So we often go down to the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection or request documents uh, that they get. So that's, a, that's one aspect. If there's any kind of permitting or agency action involved in the issue you're working on, it's possible that that agency has documentation uh, as part of that permitting process that should be public record. Right. And then another thing I know, Veronica, and I'm sure you're on many mailing lists as well, but uh, a lot of these wonderful groups are tracking the bills and they know when we need to call. And if you're on their mailing list, they'll say, you know, pull the trigger now. We need you to write your letters. We need you to call. And they'll often pose great talking points. So um, as Christine said, they have su such a great network at PLAN. Uh, it'd be great to, you could probably start there. And if they don't know, they could probably direct you to who might know. Yeah, and, and Laura, um, our executive director, dropped in the chat the link uh, if you want to see the list of who our member groups are. Uh, and our website also has, you can sign up for our email list, so we'll send updates about different legislative topics and um, action alerts when there are things moving. Um, but we also have a community calendar, so we try to keep that updated with all of the events that we're also hearing about from other partners um, available. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Jackie is asking, can you share some of the biggest issues we're going to be seeing in our legislative session this year? Yeah, I think um, one of the biggest issues we are working on is, is housing and tenant protections. Um, that's been an issue in Nevada for quite some time, housing affordability um, that was really exacerbated during the pandemic. Um, and while we took some actions during the last legislative session, there are a lot of tenant protection bills um, that were not able to move forward. And so all of those are coming back this legislative session. Um, and we have a coalition working on that called the Nevada Housing Justice Alliance. Um, so that will be one of our big priorities and I think hope will take up a lot of space at the legislature. Um, we are also hearing, I mentioned earlier, a lot of things topic on water. Um, you know, the bills that John talked about, the Pit Lake bill has to do with water. There's also conversations about conjunctive management um, and things that came out of the interim committees. Um, so I expect that to be another very um, busy topic area. Um, I also think I'm um, not exactly sure on how much we'll move, but I know that the, the executive branch and the legislative branch will probably have some disagreements on criminal justice reform issues um, and potentially on democracy and election related issues. Um, so I believe those will come up. I'm just not necessarily sure what the movement on those kinds of issues might look like. Oh yeah, and Laura just by education will may definitely be a big issue. <laughs> Education is always a big issue. Yeah. yeah. And 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 Christine brought up a, a point that I also wanted to make. A lot of times there are so many bills um, that not everything can be addressed in a four-month session. And so a lot of you know times they'll 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 choose to table them and sometimes they come back for the next session, sometimes they don't, sometimes there's a special session. Um, but keep in mind that, that we we really you know, while our legislature is um, very accessible, it's also very short and it's also only every other year. Mm -hmm. And um, so they have a lot of work to do in those four months. They're busy, 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 but again, they still wanna hear from you. Yeah, right now we have almost 900 bill draft requests on listed online. 
Um, I would say maybe wow. half of those will actually like move forward. A lot of them won't make it past introduction. Um, but we still have multiple hundreds of bills that end up being signed through at the end of session. So yeah. those deadline dates I mentioned earlier really do narrow um, that list down. It's a really exciting um, opportunity too. I mean, to, to, to lobby, to go watch it, to, to track bills and, and see, you know, from start to finish how something starts, how somebody brings up an issue, presents it, and, you know, as a bill draft request whether it becomes a bill, moves through committee, and then becomes a law. It's it's really exciting to be part of that whole process. Um, so it's, you know, I encourage all of you to, to just jump in there. And if you haven't already, even just to watch it, if you don't make comment, if you don't show up in Carson City, if you don't make phone calls, just watch the process. It's really exciting. Um, um, and they did expand that last session so that it and it will be again, um, everything will live stream on YouTube, um, which is a much easier format, I think, for community members to be able to watch. Yeah, yeah that's great. Mm. Uh, Tina, I just I just want to make sure everyone knew I did put the uh, the bill draft request number in the chat. It's bill draft request 590 for our Pit Lake bill. Yeah, thank you for that, John. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions or comments? I, I know that I, I'm seeing some people on the the, um, the call here that who have um, participated in legislature, who have you know been through sessions and who have lobbied and who have talked to, who have helped some of our legislators get elected. Um, so, does anybody else have any questions, any comments, any anything else to talk about? All righty. Well, it looks like we might there's, be ready to. Oh, is there? There's. Uh, I know Sarah's on the line, and I believe the Washoe Dems are doing another training. Also, if you guys need more information, and the Nevada Women's Lobby is also doing something. So we have some fabulous groups in Nevada that really want us to get engaged. And as Tina and John and Christine have mentioned, uh, our legislature is so accessible. And if you've not been down to Carson to testify in person, I encourage you to do that this year. It's it's fun and um, we can make a difference here. So find your issues and or issue and and go be a, a voice to get that across the finish line. Absolutely. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Sarah says there, Washoe Dems, um, Washoe Democratic Party are hosting on January 21st in person at Washington Dems headquarters, which is just down, just across the street from the airport. And, and across the street from Plan. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Washington Dems and Plan are right next to each and, other. Um, I also just dropped my email in the chat and I um, know that the presentation I shared, um, we'll make sure that that can be shared out to folks afterwards. So feel free um, to reach out to me if there are any questions that come up um, after tonight. All right, thank you, Christine. And reach out to John too. I know he's always looking for people to get involved in the mining and water issues. And as we all know, water is a huge issue in Nevada. We never have enough of it. We always need more. So, um, uh, all right. Well, it looks like we might be ending a little bit early tonight. I want to thank everybody for coming. We really appreciate your involvement in our education and action series um, and your interest in getting involved in Nevada, in your community, helping your neighbors and your friends and your family to. Um, have a great strong state and uh, to address all the issues that we care about. Um, thanks again, Christine and John. And um, I hope everybody has a great evening. Thank you. Glad to be here. Tina, Thank I you. just want to close with one more. Uh, thanks, John, Christine, and Tina. And um, for those of you who are still here, we are volunteer led. Uh, if you feel inspired to make a donation to Nevada Marches Forward, we can use funds to help us with the Women's March and to keep these month sessions kind of big budget, but a little budget helps us do a lot of different things. And if you're interested in getting involved with the Women's March, we put a link there. Um, next month, our session is going to be talking about our unhoused neighbors, and we've got some great speakers, and we will also be talking about, we'll probably know some of the bills at that time, addressing homelessness, addressing housing affordability. 
So it'll be a great session. It will be on February 21st. And um, wishing everybody a great night. Tina, thank you much for putting this together. Jackie, who is retiring from our group, thank you for hosting this. I wasn't sure I could launch it from here. I'm on a vacation, but it's great to see all of you. And we'll see you in Carson or our next meeting or the March or somewhere. We love that Reno so long we run into each other. And thanks again to our speakers. This was great. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Good night.